Well, hello, everybody. We, we are so grateful to have our, our uh, gathering today out of love and respect for Birgitta Balakari. And uh, we welcome wholeheartedly all of you um, that have come to this gathering. Everyone on the panel, Mia, Kari, Bob, Sandy, Yako, Ray, and Dirk, and our chat, people that are going to be helping with the chat, Isolde and Raffaella, thank you all so much for coming. And we welcome you on behalf of Open Dialogue, Open Excellence, and the Madden America Foundation. Zine. Um, we wanted to begin by acknowledging that there's deep sorrow in this gathering at the loss of our beloved, for many of us, teacher and colleague and friend and uh, family member. We have with us today Saiya and Yane Alakai, Birgitta's son and daughter very grateful that you are able to be with us. And we welcome all of you who have come from many parts of the world. This is the first time that we've come together as community since the loss of Birgitta and grief is present with us. And we also come to honor her life and work and to share some of her very careful um, many, many years of experience, understandings, and words. Um, uh, thank you. And now we, we'd like to invite Yako Sekula to uh, introduce um, himself and why we're gathered here today. Hello to everyone. And uh, in this very sad moment, I'm also very pleased to have this option to, to honor the life and work of Birgitta and uh, her contribution about, for the more human psychiatric practices that she was involved, developed in the first in Lapland, in Finland, in Tornio, and thereafter within the community world around. So my name is Jarko Seikula, and uh, I'm, I had a great uh, pleasure to work together with Birg Birgitta during the early years, since the early years of 80s. And during the time we were able to create this more human understanding of how to meet people in the most uh, severe uh, misery they have in their lives. And uh, step by step, Birgitta became a kind of spirit of the open dialogue. It was a work of all of us, but Birgitta, after becoming all the, all the way around while working as a psychiatrist in the hospital, and thereafter while working as a chief of the psychiatric organization in the Western Lapland Health District, really became a, a main contributor for the, for the practice, both in her manner to be very friendly and warm collaborator, and also in her manner to be a very wise leader with all. After mm -hmm. my uh, leaving Keropodas and uh, Tornio, we, I, I, I had a pleasure to work with Birgitta a lot with different uh, research projects. And in this uh, research project, project actually that was continued until the very end of her life. She made her very, very, very final comments in one paper that we were writing only two months before her, her death, so that uh, she has a very great impact. In uh, this seminar, we will focus all the things that we remember we want to focus, but I would like to start to introduce some piece of her importance to finding a way to develop a human psychiatric practices in which the use of a medication is declined and uh, built up more place for the interactional way of meeting with, with people. And uh, I will share as first a screen by showing only one piece of uh, research that was made in the Western Lapland, and that is a 
follow-up of people who became into the treatment because of their psychotic problems in the 90s and early 2000. In open dialogue treatment in Western Lapland, there were altogether 108 persons. And uh, this was uh, compared to the people who came into the treatment between 95 and 96 in the rest of Finland. And after approximately 19 years, we can see that there are huge differences about the life of the clients. We can see that uh, people in their traditional treatment were hospitalized more than one month, almost 100% of cases. After 19 years, they still have contact with psychiatry in 50% compared to 28% in the people who were met in the open dialogue care. And uh, they, were, they are using neuroleptic medication in 80% of cases in the, in, the, in the rest of Finland compared to with more than 30%, 36% in, in Western, about the patients who came into the treatment in Western Lapland. And uh, the most dramatic situation is that the people who came into the treatment in this open dialogue uh, uh, care in Lapland, more than two thirds of them have returned to full active work still after 19 years, compared to 60% being, retire, uh, being retired because of incapacities in, in the rest of Finland. This is a huge difference. And one, my point for today is to think about that one core element in these outstanding outcomes is the use of medication, because really there has happened a decline of the role of neuroleptic medication in a meeting with the psychotic crisis. And in this respect, let's stop sharing. And in this respect, the work of Birgitta was most essential. When we started uh, this research project, actually in 92, it was a part of need adapted approach development in Finland. And Birgitta became the one who was clinically in charge to introduce the new idea to not to start with the neuroleptic medication with the people who were suffering with psychotic problems, and step by step, this became uh, a kind of uh, idea of her work on the, on the whole. And in this way, I think that uh, one of the main explanations of the good outcomes is that uh, really in Western Lapland, they have managed to decline the role of medication by introducing more human ways of meeting with the people. No longer thinking so much about the symptoms, but more thinking about the life on the, on the whole. In uh, 2016, in Gothenburg in Sweden, there was uh, founded an institute of, uh, of uh, supporting the ideas how to withdraw of medication in psychiatric patients. And uh, in this uh, meeting, Birgitta had a speech in which she spoke about her practice and her way of uh, of, uh, of uh, thinking about, uh, about the treatment on the whole and especially on the medication. And this film you can find in YouTube and probably many of you already have seen it. But for this uh, webinar, I have chosen two pieces to, to look shortly about her, about her ideas. Thank you, Jakob. Yes, welcome, Birgitta. Thank you. It's very interesting to be here now, and I would like to talk about our work in Western Lapland, and how I would like to tell about my own understanding the need of neuroleptic medication on antidepressiva medication, and how to prescribe medication if somebody is needed. And also something about our treatment model. There you can see Torneo is Western Lapland and I have worked there over 30 years. And I'm 
happy I could work also in the hospital and also in outpatient settings. And I was chief psychiatrist, so I could take responsibility of my patient also when they go to the hospital. Maybe Western Lapland is better known as a place where open dialogue approach was developed and all of our staff members were developing that approach. It was made together. In early 80s when I began my career in psychiatry, our hospital was very big and it was so-called B hospital in Finland. All our patients were chronic schizophrenic patients and they had a very heavy medication, very much antipsychotic medication, at least two different ones. And of course they had side effects and we gave also some medication against them. And as I heard Sami said about diagnosis and medication, something I would like to say also same way. And after these 30 years, I still not know what, the, what is the diagnosis, the right diagnosis when I meet the patient. And if I know the right diagnosis, it is so that I should say what the, is the right treatment, the right medication. But when I meet the, the patients, the diagnosis, I, I have to say that the diagnosis changes all the time. According to the ESD, ICD-10, and it changes when we are in relationship with the patients. In traditional psychiatry, I think the psychiatrist is some kind of medical authority. Nobody asks about his recommendations or prescriptions, and they are not doubtful. So the medication or the need of the medication, it has not been dis discussed together. The pe family and the patient and the other people around the patient, also the other staff members or professionals, they trust the doctor. So, but they have also many kind of fears, but also some kind of hope of miracle that medication can help or make some kind of miracle. And also the psychiatrist prescribes medication according his or his own training. In that way, the medication is not integrated to to the whole treatment process. It is only one different separate part of the treatment. And if you prescribe the medication in the first beginning, it can happen so that the medication is the most important issue during the whole, whole treatment. How does it, the medication affect? Is it too much? It is too low? All people look, uh, symptoms disappeared. So that the medication is the, maybe it can come the only discussion about the medication. And what happens in real life? Some, something Sami and Olga were talking about. It is not important in the <coughs> treatment. And I think that it happens if the medication is prescribed in, uh, in, in the beginning. In our experience, we, we began so-called treatment meetings in 1984, and also the medication was discussed in those meetings.
Pharmaceutical companies sell medications. When they are introducing their products, they are talking about the continuation of a medication and relapses are. But how to understand the re relapse? I think that the relapse is usually a new crisis. And of course, everybody can have a new crisis. If you have been depressed in, you, and afterwards you got depression once again, you can have some crisis in your life. But I want to tell something about our, our open dialogue approach, how it can be helpful and how it can decrease the need of medication. Because if the patient and the family can get help very easily and quickly, the situation is not so severe, not so chronic, and there are many possibilities to change and think another way. And people, they have not decided that this is a disease. It is something what is happening in their lives. And the network is always very important. They are eager to help, and they have new explanations, and their understanding about the situation is very important. Flexibility and mobility, as we see our patient at home settings, we can see the empowerment when we see them in their own environment. Responsibility, if the same team and the same doctor, same psychiatrist is responsible during the whole treatment process, process. Also the doctor can understand more and see more and see what is happening and he can trust to the process more. And this is something I would like to change in our psychiatric system because in that 20 years follow-up our psychologist Pau, if there are many doctors, the patient got many, many medications, more medication than if there, there was only one psychiatrist. And I think that it is quite easy to change this, at least in our region, because it is small district and we have no so many doctors. The same doctor can follow during the whole treatment process, also if a patient goes to the hospital. And tolerance of uncertainty to give time to spontaneous recover and also trust to the, the team work is very important. Dialogue, <coughs> everything is discussed together. Also in those treatment meetings, also the medication is discussed. But I hope that it, it is not most important issue. It is only one issue now and then. And if the medication is prescribed, it is important to discuss, discuss it and also to evaluate it and to stop the medication. But I need other staff members to those discussions. Uh, this is my thoughts about prescribing the medication. All the time I find it more important to discuss about the medication, what kind of feelings, what kind of fears, what kind of hopes the people have about the medication. And I need that case-specific team to that discussion. In our district, in our, in our psychiatry, I have said that no psychiatrist is allowed to meet the patient alone. He, there has to be some member from a case-specific team. So that also the discussion about the medication is much more easier with the nurse or psychologist 
she can ask why I'm thinking about medication, why, why I'm recommending it, how long, what side effects, that kind of questions. And also the family members and the patient can ask also those questions. But I think it is e for them it is easier to, to ask than there are somebody else also asking. If I prescribe medication, it is important why, why I am doing it. Also family members, they should know why the, their relative is taking some medication. And low doses and not for a long time to evaluate it. This was most important for this meeting, how to get off the medication. All psychiatric medication, they affect too many receptors in our brains. And our brains are very wise and flexible. They try to adapt to changes. So the consequence, for example, when somebody is taking antipsychotic medication, the dopamine receptors are increasing in our brains. And after some time, we have much more receptors than before the medication. And if somebody stops antipsychotic medication very quickly, you got some kind of brainstorm. Maybe it can cause hallucination or some kind of other symptoms. And it is not a relapse. It is because of withdrawal of the medication. So that it is important to stop medication very slowly so that our brains can adapt to new situation. It can take two years or four years. I have many examples. I have met many patients and usually it takes quite a long time. It takes also a long time because in some cases I have recommended earlier stop stopping the medication or withdrawal of the medication. But the patient and the family, they are afraid. One young man, he had medi medication, I think it almost over one year. He, he was so afraid to stop the medication that in the end of the medication he took only very small amount of antipsychotic medication once a week. It is not, it is no sense, but it was important to him. And he could stop the medication that way. And also, I remember young men, and so the family members, they are afraid of stopping the medication. I should stop now, but... Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We'd like to go to the panelists for their thoughts. Um, and uh, I'd like to just uh, say, let the audience know, in um, we, we, what we're trying to do here is a little different than the usual sort of talk show that you might see. We're not asking questions. We're not directing the conversation. Uh, and we're inviting the panel to leave space for thought. Um, that when somebody has said what they had to say, to take a couple of breaths before the next person speaks and let, uh, you know, provide the opportunity to let what they said sink in and uh, even maybe they get a chance to uh, think about what they've just said and if they you know, want to add something to that. Uh, and what that also does is it gives the people, the, all of the attendees in the chat room a chance to also think about what's being talked about and uh, maybe communicate with each other and ask questions. Um, basically, we're trusting the wisdom of the panel to know where they need to go. And we're trusting the wisdom of the uh, attendees in the chat room to know what they need to talk about uh, rather than just try to drive uh, a conversation in a single direction. And with that, I'd like to invite 
the panelists to uh, introduce themselves, uh, starting with Dirk. Uh, just your, your name uh, and where you live and just a word or two about how you come to be doing this. My name is Dirk Korstens. I live in the Netherlands and I work as a psychiatrist in the north of our country. And I started to work in psychiatry in 1984 as a doctor. So at the same time as Open Dialogue started in Finland, I think. Thank you. That enough? Thank you. Terry? Hey, hello to all. Um, my name is Kari Valtanen. I'm a psychiatrist uh, at the Adolescent Psychiatric Outpatient Clinic in, in Western Lapland. Um, I've been working there since 20 years and, and uh, just I realized that how big uh, influence really Birgitta has had on, on, on my thinking uh, when watching the video. Um, um, I'd like to say my condolences to the family members and friends because there hasn't been really a gathering before Lammin Osanottoni teidän kaikille läheisille, kun ei ollut hauteisiä. Briefly finished just to noticing that I'm really happy to join this meeting with the family members here as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, my name is Mia Kurtti. Uh, I'm a nurse and a family therapist from Western Lapland, Tornio. I have been working with Birgitta uh, since 2002 until 2014 when she retired. And during and after that, doing trainings together and, and writing together and thinking together, talking together. Um, and yes, I also want to honor the fact that, that the family members are here Hey, hey, minunkin puolesta. And that we all are here. This is a wonderful honor. Thank you. Thank you. Sandy? Uh, so I'm Sandy Steingard. I'm a psychiatrist in the United States. And um, I found my way in Tornio, I think it was 2012, after having learned about it through Robert Whitaker's working and had the great honor, pleasure, privilege of meeting Birgitta and want to echo the, um, the condolences offered to um, her family and friends and colleagues who um, worked with her in a much closer way. I can say, you know, we'll get into it, but the day that I, I knew she was ill. When I heard she died, I sat in my kitchen and wept. You know, and you think about what it is that a person affects someone on the other side of the world so deeply. And I think we'll probably be talking about that. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Ray. Hi, everyone. Um, Oh, my name is Ray Waddingham. I'm from Leicestershire here in England and the UK. Uh, I am many things, like everyone here. I have lived experience of the diagnosis of schizophrenia. I hear voices. Um, I'm an open dialogue practitioner, a facilitator and a trainer. And I um, feel surprisingly moved at the moment sitting here with you guys and just having some of the words of the Gita running through that feel like beautiful gifts that really resonate with the way that I see the world. And I'm looking forward to, to sharing some of that with you guys. Thank you. 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 I went to Tornio as I was writing this book, as Sandy said, called Anatomy of an Epidemic. And I was looking for a place where they had good outcomes for their psychotic patients and also were using antipsychotics in a different manner, a sort of a selective use manner. And this was the one place in the world where I found that to be so. I traveled there and forget to couldn't have been kinder and more welcoming in letting me, giving me time to understand what was going on there. 
And I just think it's great gathering here today because I think she needs to be appreciated for a real transformative person in the history of psychiatry. And I don't often think she gets that recognition. So it's great to be here. Thank you, Bob. So opening to dialogue amongst you of what touched you about Birgitta's words and what you feel to share. I could say some thoughts while looking at the, I'm, I'm, I've really been looking at the video many times and, uh, and uh, I find it very, very good speech about the issues. And uh, even if I know while being with working with Birgit a long time in, in the hospital, so that there is a lot of things in which Birgit has affected and, and the medication issue is not the only one. But I also think that it's very important to make point about this because uh, that's a, in, in a way when we started to create a new let's say a kind of need adapted way to use the medication, neuroleptic medication in psychotic problems, instead of using that automatically, that strongly against to the main idea in psychiatry. And also thereafter, they started to immerse their, their treatment to excellence guideline in which it's almost a kind of a law. I know that there are some countries in which uh, you are condemned if you do not prescribe medication. But uh, Birgitta was very bold to going on with this issue. And I know that the, that the psychiatric uh, system outside was, uh, was not that friendly <laughs> towards her with this I, I, idea. So that she was very bold to go through with all these suspicions by relying on the team so that she could also, also all the time rely that, uh, that she's not alone but all her work was based on the team. And, 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 and that's what I especially like in her, in her works that she, that she said that, uh, that the change is possible if we start to work in a more open way in a team without this, of course, we have professional hierarchies, but not the kind of uh, conversational hierarchies that we, we can all use our resources. And I think that that was the strength of Birgitta, that she really could mobilize the resources of her colleagues in respect to what level of the hierarchy in the staff members they, they were. And I still want to highlight for me, it's so important. I suppose that uh, I, 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 I know a bit about the situation in the world and I do not know so many psychiatrists that so long time has been working persistently with the idea not going into the medication. So perhaps they really had the uh, had, uh, had, uh, most experience of looking what happens in the life of psychotic patients when they are not when they when they are medicated when they are not medicated or if they use medication it's also stopped and as we as uh, Tommy Periström as a main researcher as we were involved in the long term follow up we really could follow the the, the long part of their lives afterwards and the, in this way the knowledge that Birgitta was producing is a very convincing the val external validity of this knowledge is very strong. It's much stronger compared to this uh, laboratory kind of studies in which it, it's, it is referred. So that uh, I, I, I really want to make, emphasize the importance of this boldness. Um. Actually, when you, Jakob, spoke, I was thinking I paid attention maybe to some uh, the same, same issues. I wrote down here um, words like whole stuff approach. Uh, and this, uh, how much um, Virgitta really uh, cherries the collaboration and, and the voices of uh, and, and the input from everyone in the professional team, but also the other 
network members and, and family members, and, and of course the patient uh, ser service user um, themselves. Um, and, and this really uh, stepping down from the, from, from the position of, of uh, um, in high in hierarchy to, to really to, to collaborate. And, and that's something what I think a lot in my work every day and how, how we can keep up with this uh, same fashion of working. Yes, I am remembering the, the, the years when I went to the adolescence clinic to work there. It was established in the early 2000s uh, and they were really the team there. There are people who are present in this, is, in this event as well from that team um, who were really establishing that unit uh, based on the ideas of open dialogue and based on the, the research that you did, Jaco, in the, in the 80s and 90s. And, and one thing that I have been thinking, when I have been thinking about Birgitta, and this is something that we spoke a lot about the trust, about the, the that how she was trusting to people, she was trusting people, she was trusting us, she was trusting in life. Um, and she also wrote um, that one of the main tasks in training is to create people uh, the trust towards social networks and towards dialogue. That how can we stay even when it's when it seems that we cannot stay? That was something that she was talking a lot uh, in our conversations, and that is our task to to stay there even when it feels that it's impossible in many ways. And she was inviting all the time, everyone to be part of those conversations in organizational level and, and in treatment processes. She was so always looking for the possibilities and, and increased kind of, uh, yeah, increased uh, number of voices. Hmm. I think as I hear you guys talking, um, it takes me back to the bits of the video where Birgitta's talking about relapse. Um, I felt like hugging her through the <laughs> when she mentioned her way of viewing this thing called relapse, because to me, this time where, where things get difficult again, when the voices, the beliefs, the, the communication challenges come in, can be so disruptive and, and overwhelming for everybody. It feels very much like a system response to that is close everything down, add the medication back in or increase it, stop the dialogue, <laughs> get it safe and then try and open up again. And certainly in my personal life, that's been catastrophic. It's deprived me of opportunities for growth and for connection and left me alone. And it feels like what Bagita and the rest of you and the team have created is a space where we stay with and be with, even when it's tricky and maybe use medication. But I think, like she said, the medication becomes everything very quickly, um, which is so sad because even in my life for, the, for more than a decade, more than 20 years, medication, even if I don't take it, is still prominent in my thinking <laughs> because it was introduced very at the start um so yeah this ability to commit and believe in the dialogue is just profound and the humility that she never says i did this this is mine it's you guys did it the people who were there then did it <laughs> and we keep doing it together
um, you know, it, there's like so much to say. And maybe I was thinking I could explain like why her work had so much impact on a psychiatrist working on the other side of the world in a, another small town in the north of our country. And it, it so much captures what a lot of you said that the thing, the thing that she said about relapse as a new crisis also hit me. And what I was thinking is how profoundly radical that concept is in the context of a lot of Western psychiatry where it's assumed it's a known, it's like the known fact that this is just the recurrence of some illness. So that leads to using the medications to you know, quash it down. And it's just a profoundly different way of, um, of thinking about this. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to say is, um, you know, she said in that, I still don't know. I mean, there was so much in that video that's so rich. Uh, every time I listen to it, I learn more. And that not knowing, um, I said somewhere, like, I came to open dialogue because of the drugs and I stayed for the dialogue. I mean, I am interested in the pharmacology, but I learned so much from all of you. I mean, I'm staring at a screen of people who have been so important in my life, including Brigitte, but that way of being. And I had come to the conclusion that the only valid way to think about psychiatry is uncertainty, but that's so hard to do by yourself. <laughs> and so she, you know, being on um, this woman leader who seemed to have the fortitude to do what she did was just, you know, just profoundly helpful. That is what I uh, <clears throat> what it evokes in me is that uh, she must have been a very powerful woman. And as a psychiatrist with these ideas and being faithful to it for more than 30 years, that's uh, an effort, I think, a, a big effort. And I liked uh, in the video what she said about don't leave psychiatrists alone with clients. <laughs> it's on the one hand, it's, it's human, but on the other hand, it's very simple, very well on the other hand, that you uh, uh, that you understand how difficult it is to stay away from the role of a doctor and that medication, as he said, becomes the subject of all treatment. And that's what I experience now in the situation I work that people are used, I started a new job and people immediately start to talk about their medications instead of just making contact. So I think, uh, to to do to for me uh, doing together that's that's what what it uh, said to me in the video and what she uh, very important lessons and indeed there is a lot in this video I saw it now three times and it's very rich yeah. I'd just like to circle back a little bit to what Yako said. Um, it's not easy being a psychiatrist, breaking with your tribe <laughs> when you're a doctor. And that's what she did for 30 years. And that took incredible bravery. And just in terms of her, to just to look at it from a historical perspective, since antipsychotics came on the scene, I only really know of two prolonged efforts to see what outcomes might be if you made different use of medications, less use of antipsychotics. One was the Soteria project, which was led by Lauren Mosher in the 70s. And they actually had about a 10-year project and they found better outcomes that way. 
And then since then, there's only been one place in the Western world that has really tried to use medications in a different way as part of a larger paradigm of care. And that's, you know, what was done with the group and led by Brigitte in, in Northern Finland. And that's a transformative story, what happened in Torneo and what they, 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 they presented their data. And we saw it with in both what the slide that Yako showed us and also what she spoke about, a chance to really reimagine what is possible for people when they first come in as first episode. And that's a real gift to everybody and every society. And it, it's potentially transformative. And the last thing I want to say, one thing about being with Brigitte, she wasn't anti-medicine in, in, in any way. She, I always thought that she had the idea of when you, when you think of a good doctor, it's for whom and for how long, right? That's always the, the, the key question with the use of medications, for whom and for how long. And I think under her leadership, that's what was sort of developed, a protocol for whom and for how long. And it was that selective use that really made it possible to have these humane practices really flourish. And so, you know, if, if psychiatry is going to change to a different way, uh, what Birgitta led, she's really a transformative figure, and I hope she's remembered for that. And it took a lot of bravery and courage, and she did it with absolute grace, I think, too. Just want to add, as you said, Rob, uh, Bob, for who and for how long, something just in me. And it was like, for who, for how long, and how? And it's the how that she started to talk about, and that I'd love to have more conversations with her and with everybody here. <laughs> because I think sometimes when prescribers look for protocols, they're looking for characteristics in the client, i.e. me, that mean medication will or won't be useful. And what I was hearing was a relational way of going, I've got an idea it might be useful, and then I trust my colleagues to question me and the family and the client to question and that we work it out together. And certainly in the open dialogue team I worked in in Kent, this is what we tried to do. And it was really refreshing to sit with a psychiatrist or a nurse and for me to be the one saying, I'm wondering, is medication something we might want to talk about? And then go, oh, why do you say that, Ray? The mad person in the room. <laughs> you know, it wasn't the psychiatrist holding the meds responsibility fully. It was shared. And it was the smallest part of all of the conversations. But it was the how that was the key, I think. Uh, <clears throat> I, was, uh, I was also paying att attention when Birgitta said about that the whole team should discuss about the uh, medication. It's not really about the psychiatrist. And, so to, and also to discuss it about it many times and look for different options and, and uh, alternatives and, and think about uh, the pros and cons. Uh, and when, when you can all discuss about it, uh, to me, it seems we then find also different ways to go ahead. But, but I think that's the, the whole team approach. What, what I just found out this idea, that's, uh, that's what it really is about. I mean, one thing I was going to add, and it's sort of, I guess, being a psychiatrist here, it's suited that it's a kind of technical comment, but what was happening in the United States and other parts right around the time when you were all doing your research up there and holding off on using meds was this very prominent hypothesis that delaying medications does harm. So it's not just, you know, helping to be with the person and finding a safe place. There was, you were going to lead to worse outcomes if you delayed this. And it was promoted by a, a very powerful psychiatrist at the National Institute of Mental Health. And it's hold sway, even though the data on it remains questionable to this day. And the work that you've done, which would challenge it, tends to be ignored. So it just another, it's just another piece of how, to me, so profound it is that you were all able to work in this way, um, given 
what was happening uh, and continues to happen really in the rest of the, a lot of the Western uh, psychiatric establishment, I think. One thought coming up into my mind, both after the comments of Bob and Sandy is that uh, Bob, you used the word of transformative work and transformative period that we are living in psychiatry. If you think for a while, the table that I showed in the very beginning of the webinar, and you look at the outcomes of this traditional psychiatry, it's, it's terrible. It's really terrible because nothing has happened during 30 years. And uh, actually there are some uh, who, are, who, have, who are saying that the outcomes has become worse exactly on the period of time that Sandy was referring. There appeared this hysteria that psychosis is neurotoxic and you need to medicate to prevent that toxic process without any evidence. It was a hypothesis that was developed uh, it was uh, actually, I, I, I read the paper about the person who developed this idea and, and he tried to calm down and say that people, I don't, I don't have a research, it's a kind of hypothesis that you can make about it, but it really took over all. And it, it really has taken over the psychiatry and, 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 and has made a lot of harm. And in my mind, uh, the work of Birgitta and the idea of open dialogue and all other hum more human approaches is in a way to, to, I don't know how to say it in English, to, to have the flag throughout the dark period that there are human humanist choices still, that not all need to follow this, this very bad road that has been built up built up of, of, of very poor research that is based on. And that's why it's for me also so valuable that, uh, that uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be involved in this open dialogue because I know that it, it, it's, this is the case. Really humans in their miseries need to be met in a human way. And there is no sense only to look at the symptoms and, and, and this is this could not have happened if, if Birgitta and of course other doctors, other psychiatrists who have been working has not been involved as a part of the team, but, but still very important role. And I'm thinking also when listening to you that, that when it happens in, in the meetings and in, in treatment processes, the, the polyphonic discussion about different possibilities and, and challenges that there are. Uh, also, one thing what she did was that she uh, make sure that there were many arenas in the whole organization uh, where we could discuss about these things together. And, and the, mainly the focus was in those uh, days that, that, why are we here for? <laughs> Why are we doing this work and how are we doing that? And what are our be beliefs when we are doing this? And I think it, it takes that, that is needed in organizations and systems so that people can really learn to know each other and to discuss with each other um, about their worldviews and, and understandings. Because more dis disconnect, if people are disconnected, uh, there becomes to be these vacuumed ideas about and, and different kind of hypotheses about humanity and people start to work differently and maybe more structured way that is possibly not so helpful. So I do trust the dialogue in every level of the system. And she did that too. And she learned that to us. Cindy asked uh, earlier before this meeting uh, the question about what, what made all this possible. And I'm, I'm re really admiring all the genius choices you made at the 80s, starting to, to um, um, look at the relation, uh, relational world, the, 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 the social um, 
uh, relations and the, the, the uh, how meaningful uh, uh, the family relations are and then uh, the support from network uh, this whole team approach of, of uh, uh, putting up such uh, training programs uh, to for the whole staff every everyone joining them uh, that um, you could really discuss about the values of the work, uh, the, 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 the ideas about what, what are we thinking about this uh, work and how we collaborate, how we, how we understand the crisis together and how can we be there together. And then this research program. So I think there were so many kind of genius choices made in, in this. It's also a community to me that uh, um, I've, got, I've got such a huge admiration to, to, to all of you who started put, putting this up and, and how I think it's kind of a living organism still. And I'm, I'm hoping that um, it, it could be, it would be possible to, to bring it to different places uh, around the world because there is such a need for these ways of working. And Birgitta was such a <laughs> carrying uh, all this, uh, uh, not alone, but together with, with the, all the st staff. And, and um, I feel very credit, a lot of gratitude. Um, I'm just thinking um, that one of the, the questions that's come up in the, the Q&A was how does open dialogue relate to risk? And it feels really relevant because I know, Sandy, you were talking about this when we met on Wednesday. It's like, it's one thing to say that this approach, we, we don't talk about medication so much, we're much more careful. But what the sticking point when we talk to often people who are not using this approach is what do you do in really scary situations when things are really heightened, everyone's freaking out? How do you not resort to meds as the first port of call? And I'm, I got the sense when we were talking that for Begita and many people in, in this, this approach in Western Lapland, it's something about the quality of being. How can you be with someone in a crisis when everyone's worried around them? I don't know if anyone has anything they want to say to that. Actually, one situation comes up into my mind. This happened. This is one, one of the of the families that were involved also in the research, and uh, they had a daughter, who about sixteen years of age, who had moved to. To occupational college nearby the city that she was living and from home so that she did not want to go from home but was actually living in the other city and uh, and uh, when East, uh, she studied her studies in August and when Eastern time came in the early early April and when she was come, when she came home the parents saw that that, that there, there is a uh, big problems now that they need to make contact and 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 um, in very different situation they went to the primary healthcare center of course they contacted the crisis team and it was organized meet at home because they did not want to have their daughter at their home and she was in a very bad situation she stopped speaking she was turning her eyes into the into the roof and and uh, making the swinging movements and not so much anything else and there was a team going on and uh, uh, and the team uh, there was an other doctor and uh, Birgitta uh, was not able to be part of the team but she said to the team that uh, that that you can be in contact with me all every time you are there and every time they went uh, went to their home and uh, actually Birgitta also asked me that if I could do I could be part of a kind of supporting group because it really sounded very difficult, challenging situation. 
and uh, and uh, the team was very anxious and and very occupied of the situation and uh, quite immediately they started to speak about that this is so severe situation that we need to go into the meditation and what did Birgitta respond what did he respond respond was let's see tomorrow and the day of tomorrow uh, they met with their family and uh, and uh, and uh, were very anxious and very occupied and uh, came and, uh, and 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 said and what did Birgitta say Birgitta say let's see tomorrow how is the situation in, in tomorrow and and step by step we really managed to have more safety and actually quite uh, uh, I don't know what is rapid, but in, in, in four months time, this uh, crisis was is of the way that she, she decided to go into the, into the school. And, uh, and uh, in, uh, we, I met this family in uh, follow-up interviews and also Birgitta was involved in the follow-up interviews. And uh, for, for the family, it was very important. They were very occupied for their daughter and the daughter became very occupied of her situation afterwards. But this is uh, one example of the, even if sensing the pain and the misery of the family and which is spread to the people who are meeting with the families, you have this idea that there may be some other options also. But I suppose that it was in this situation important to have a kind of outside support for the team also, to not take all, all alone of this very uncertain situation that they were, they were living. Yes, and of course, this is this is a big topic as everything is. Uh, but uh, I remember doing my first summer uh, when I was working at the ward, 2002. Uh, there was a crisis situation. Um, and I was thinking with my, uh, well, my, I just got out from the school and I was thinking that, okay, when there's a crisis, people come to the hospital. That's the way it has to be. And, and they said that, no, we go to their homes. And we were, I remember we were building up these evening shifts uh, to, to, the, to, their, to the family's home and, and we stayed there. And there were these treatment meetings, which I didn't understand yet what they were about. Uh, but I was there and, and I was guided through the whole uh, way that, that this is the way we are talking about these things. And, and when the treatment meetings ended and, and if I said something like, why did dad say like this or that? Birgitta said to me, why didn't you say that in the meeting? You are welcome to say that in the meeting when we are there. Let's be transparent about how we feel and, and think in these situations. So that was the very first learning that I had. And also about the continuity. Uh, and Birgitta has said about this uh, during the last years as well, that this is one of the main things when we think about the so-called risk, that, that when there is knowing and trust uh, and continuity, uh, everybody feels more safe. Uh, these are the first things that, that comes to me uh, when thinking about this question. And to me, uh, I'm still thinking about the, the, the teamwork and how we can kind of uh, have trust among uh, uh, between us in the team when we meet people in extreme crisis. That's how we can uh, reflect uh, um, think about how, how we can be kind of flexible, how often we should meet, uh, what voices we should listen to, should we have more voices. So I think it's also the kind of the, um, again, thinking that how we can learn to, to work together and not to, not to rush into any conclusions or, or medications or hospitalization or something but really this kind of uh, this fashion that what about we meet tomorrow or and so how, how to kind of develop this safety in, in that way yeah 
I have a question for all of you. It's a hypothesis I've had, so now I can indulge my curiosity. Um, but I, the other psychiatrist who's had an enormous influence on me, another wonderful woman psychiatrist is Joanna Moncrief. And she's written about this drug-centered approach. So you're not treating some illness, you're, you have these psychoactive drugs that may or may not be useful. And it, you know, my idea is that that's how you, that's how you were thinking about the drugs there, maybe not with that label. And, you know, the beauty of the work you do is it, it helps you to know what to do, you know, because a lot of us have, have not developed that skill, you know, because we're using the drug in a different way. And I'm just curious whether that hypothesis does resonate with the people that were doing this work up in, in uh, Northern Finland. If I briefly say that, it makes so much sense to me, like the whole open dialogue <laughs> makes sense to me that uh, I, I, this, um, I like Moncrief's idea and, and this, when we think about the, the, what are the possible benefits or possible uh, 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 disadvantages of, of medication, it's something we regularly do that think about, uh, not, not think it's as a cure, but more kind of a unspecific way to, uh, to, um, to take down some enormous anxiety or but not to think about that it would solve any distress in the long term. There's something Mia you would like to add? No, I'm just um, I'm, I'm remembering one conversation that I had with Birgitta and, and I have been asking this question from her in, in different situations. Last time, last September, when we had our research uh, theory day in our own uh, in-house training, um, and I asked from her that, that in the late 80s, why did you decide, what made you think that uh, this is the, the kind of question to, to, why did you doubt medication then? Why did you doubt that antipsychotics uh, would be useful? And she said that there was loads of knowledge already then that it had uh, challenges, that, that the, use of medication has challenges. Uh, and uh, here we are uh, over 30 years later, still having this question that should we have these medications and how much and, and for how long? Um, but I don't know, Jaco, do you remember those conversations that you had in the 80s about the medication and how was it for you then? Yes. In a way, it was a question already very early in the 80s. So that we had when we started to work, we really, as Birgitta said in the film, that there were a lot of people who had a diagnosis of schizophrenia in the hospital in a very severe situation in their lives and, uh, and uh, in a situation in which nothing seemed to help. And already that time, we had some knowledge of some forms of therapy who are not based of using the medication. And we started to work in this way also, my, myself also working, so that we had, a, we had a already then information about, there is an American um, psychotherapist, uh, his name was Bertram P. Caron, who uh, unfortunately passed away two years ago. And, uh, and uh, he, has, uh, he has produced in a way to look at the lives when people have uh, hearing voices for some, in a very concrete way. People speak about their life and it's not some illness that produces this. And his idea was not using the medication, but uh, go into the issues. And we started to follow that. But, uh, but at that time, that was, it was not, uh, we were not, mature enough because we did not have the system support that they, they were more like simple trials to go down with the medication and then this uh, research project that started in Finland in 92 made it possible to have more consistent idea of, of so that there were 
but there were also many fights, many debates, because there were also doctors who had a very different point of view in respect of, of what is the cause of, of hallucinations or what is the cause of, uh, and, and why medication is important. Perhaps I suppose that uh, for Birgitta also, it was very important that uh, in Finland, uh, because there was the research process integrated treatment in acute psychosis, very permanent uh, professionals, uh, professors and clinicians were involved. And I, I suppose that uh, as myself also, I felt a lot of support of them being involved, uh, Yrjö Alanen, Jukka Aaltonen, Viljo Räkkyläinen and, uh, and Ville Lehtinen and, uh, and others. And that also was an encouragement for Birgitta to become actively involved in this looking for new ways of work. I don't know if this is the right place to ask or, but I'm also uh, curious, uh, Robert, since we are in the same space now and, and it seems that you have connections and, and, and you are in discussions globally in many places that, do you know what's, I mean, I know that I'm inside of this, this dialogical bubble in my social media and, and in my discussions, but what, what's the situation in general in, in mental health, psychiatry, human work? Or is this question to something to- Regarding the use of medications? Yes, and, and, and how these situations and challenges in humanity are, are approached at the moment. Yeah, I, I, honestly, I think there is a, we're at a, a moment where people are addressing this question and, and really asking the question. It's been a, a slow process. People move away from a paradigm of belief very slowly, of course, and especially if they have vested interests in, in, in that belief for various reasons. But you see, even in mainstream journals, people now, A, asking, uh, do we have any evidence that antipsychotics improve long-term outcomes? So that's not quite saying that do we have evidence that, you know, that they may be doing harm on the whole, but still it's the question is now out there. You really do see it out there. That's new. You also see as part of that, uh, because really that disease model failed, that biological model, is it's failed. I mean, recovery rates for, quote, schizophrenia patients are worse now than they were 30 years ago, uh, cross-culture. So, and you are seeing, and I think, again, this is, goes to Brigitte's influence and you're all influence. You do see these other projects starting up, these pilot projects, whether it be Satyria in Israel, or you see in, in, in Norway, of course, there's this medication-free initiative. There's a hospital, a private hospital that started up with the goal of helping people taper from the medications or pri provide medication-free treatment for those who want it, including, by the way, people who are psychotic and have even been chronically ill. So it's 2021. I really think we're at an inflection point where finally this question is really being considered seriously. What is the place of these drugs in terms of helping people over the long term and not just look at symptom suppression, which is all what you've been talking about. And I think along with that, and you see this with the adaptation or the interest in open dialogue is, well, what about more human practices? What about more collaborative work? What about when you don't just have a psychiatrist telling everyone what to do, but there's this, this group work. So I think the, you know, what was planted in, in, in Northern Finland over a course of 30 years, there's a lot of ideas that are taking hold, being considered, and it's, it, it gives you hope for some real change. And I just want to go back to think about the difference in outcomes of what you see in terms of the disability rates and, and that sort of thing. You're talking about so many lives could be different. And I think that's so profound. And just to go, there was a question in the raised to the panelists and really it's to you, Yako, that said, well, how come, you, how come your research isn't given more credence? I don't know if you saw the question, but the, there's a question saying from AWAS AFTAB, 
that the research that you all have collected there and published there, because I guess because it's not a randomized trial, is not considered so convincing. So maybe you can answer that question in the Q&A. Uh, yeah, I, did, yeah, I didn't uh, re realize that question. Yeah, it's, uh, but it's a bit enigma for me also that uh, open dialogue is most scientifically studied psychiatric approach in the world that I know. I don't know any other approach that has been so much studied and evaluated in a sense of seeing the outcomes and in a way of having qualitative uh, analysis of the process to develop the dialogues. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, it still is not approved in the, in the treatment of XLS guideline with this argument that because there is not randomized trials, we cannot take it. But it's a very stupid argument. People make uh, rules to themselves and then they accuse others that you don't follow these rules. Randomized clinical trials are needed, but they produce information that is not valuable for the concrete uh, clinical practice. And our studies that we have done it's a very valid for the clinical practice. For instance, we have three times repeated the same procedure in psychotic patients and all the time having the same outcomes. A kind of verification that is really what is happening in the real life. But for me, the uh, proposal for the answer is that it's a question of human view. Because the traditional medical human view is based on symptoms. And everything is based on uh, removing the symptoms and our way of dealing with more human perspective is look at the entire human lives. And it's so difficult. People do not, for instance, when they look at the results of the outcomes that I showed you, they said that this cannot be true. And that's why I don't, I give a seat to it. Because it's not possible for them to think if you only have an idea of that uh, this is a brain disease and produce this kind of symptoms and you need medication to get rid of this. But uh, I, I, I like the words of Bob that, uh, that uh, there really is also time to speak about our view of human. How do we think about, as Ray, for instance, spoke about, how do we see things about all the things that has happened in our life and how could we introduce that part of, the, of our field also. I don't know, there have been some writings Should we comment some, it would be very interesting to know some of the comments of uh, questions that perhaps we can answer them afterwards. I would like to add one element of, of concerning here and, uh, and uh, all who have been in contact with Birgitta are saying the same, that uh, being in collaboration with her, you could not, not avoid to becoming friend with her. So, so that it's, it's so respectful way that she deals with people. And it may be that Birgitta from the very beginning was like that. I, I, I met with her when we met in, in, in the work, and not, not, not before that. But I also think that teamwork make me a better person. But I think that this idea that Kari spoke about, that when we share, when we are open in a team, we also become easily more human and more human qualities of us are present in respect only think of this, uh, this let's say, psychiatric mind. And Yeah, I was um, reflecting on the question of why, one, how do we speak about this to people that work in a very different paradigm? And how do we speak about this when the, there is a lot of research, but there are, if you come at it from another paradigm, there's flaws in the research, there's ways it can be critiqued. Um, and I think that's fine because actually we can critique the medication research, the CBT research. This is... this yeah this is this is the way um but what this approach is for me at least is about being essentially human 
and and this trust in the team, trust in the family. I think one person said in the Q and A, it's with risk when we're going back the next day and Big Eater says, let's see tomorrow, let's see tomorrow. That can sound very much like what our crisis teams in England do. They come once a day, check we're alive, <laughs> try and connect with us in ways that don't always work and then go away and then come back the next day. But what is really hard to capture, and I think I'd love us to do better at capturing, is the quality of being. In open dialogue, when I've been in a team and said, when would you like us to come back tomorrow? Great. People haven't needed to call in the meantime often because they felt like we're with them and they felt some sense of connection and stability and presence that I never experienced in the crisis team, even though it looks very similar. So it's things that can look really similar from the outside and the structure. And maybe when we're trying to measure them, they seem similar, but they feel so different. And how we can get that across, I think, is, is one of the challenges for the next few years. That's something strange that when when I sometimes speak to people from from, from working from different perspective and they start saying, we are doing the same. <laughs> So you're really pointing out uh, uh, well, well that there, there is a difference how, how to really relate and respond. It seems we have about six minutes. Um, how shall we use the last six minutes? Sage has, has uh, put up a comment on the chat that I'd love to read live. Thank you so much for your condolences, Kitos, Kitos. Thank you, Louisa Kermit Yako and others for organizing this webinar. We are very honored for this, all the kind words and the appreciative way you colleagues are remembering my mother. Thank you, Sandy, for touching memor memoriam you wrote. It's overwhelming for us family members to hear all your appreciation. <clears throat> Birgit, I appreciated you so much too and enjoyed working in therapeutics and psychiatry because of you and the people around her. Thank you. And last, last words, I remember I had the pleasure of being taught by um, Kari in, in, in Finland and you reminded me one time when I was doing something about last words, what last words do we have? I'd love to, we have five minutes. And... I'd like to offer a thought, but a uh, thought I've had in the course of this is that something that I, that I believe is common to crisis situations is that all of the things that you thought were going to be, be the answer haven't worked. And you arrive at a moment of realizing you don't know what to do. Uh, and I think that what Open Dialogue might be thought of as doing is just skipping past all the thinking that you have the answer part and getting to the part getting to the moment where you have no choice but to actually look to the people you're in the crisis with and say, what are we going to do now? Mm. That's what I got from this. My last words could be that I was quite nervous about having this webinar uh, talking here, but now I felt uh, actually quite, uh, it, it's been quite really nice to be with you and also acknowledging the interested people, a uh, lot of interested people. Sorry, we cannot discuss with everyone. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you from my part as well. Uh, 
I know it's going to be a long night, maybe next night, because things start to come alive and uh, after this conversation. But thank you for this and, and look forward to see the chat box also uh, later on. Thank you for everybody who has been here. I'll just add my thanks. It's it's an incredible honor to be here and be among you. And, you know, thanks to Brigitte and, you know, sending my condolences to her family. And I just, I feel so that the, the positive part is I just feel so incredibly grateful to have known her and to been able to be a part of what you've done. So thank you. Yeah, thank you uh, from me too. And uh, the word trust was mentioned very often and I have trust in the legacy of uh, Begitta. Thank you. Um, I've said much already, but yeah, thank you for you guys taking part and for those that have contributed in the chat. I've as always in these events, I feel so many things sparking and so many conversations I still want to have and a loss at not having them because <laughs> it's imperfect and impossible, but also deep thanks. And um, yeah, I've met Begita once, only once. I wish I'd met her more, but I feel closer to her now after this than I had when previously so thank you for giving me that gift i just want to note there's a, a thing from the chat saying why don't we have a shared moment of silence right here at the end which i think would be great because we can bring in the people from the chat room and we can all share this moment of silence and think of our appreciation of brigitte Thank you all so much. This conversation continues and uh, great gratitude for everyone's contribution. Yeah. Yeah. Yes.